Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we've got a little bit of conversation that we're having right now. Just did another video explaining to people about uh, a couple of things that I think might interest some of you, and I don't care if it does or if it doesn't. All right, how you say you don't care when you know you ca I don't care. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I was sitting up here because the problem is judges. What do you mean the problem is judges? The problem is judges. What do you mean the problem is judges? Well, see, judges have authority. Yeah, they got authority. To do what? To sit up there and judge between peoples. Like King Solomon. Because he's one of their idols. They idolize King Solomon? You better believe they idolize King Solomon. Hiram a bit. Hiram a bit. Do you know who Hiram is? Well, they do. They can give you all kind of history on Hiram that's not written down in anybody's history books, but they say it's true. Oh, you're talking about that masonry stuff. You better believe I am because most judges are masons. It's part of the creed. That's why they worship the goddess justice. They're administering for justice. Go ahead, ask them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if judges are the problem, how do we get some act right? Well, they have a process whereby you file a complaint against them for judicial misconduct. Well, I don't want to get them for misconduct. Misconduct is not the issue. I don't want to get them for misconduct. No, I want to get them for violating my rights. Well, that's misconduct. No, it isn't. Go and look at the rules of misconduct. It don't say nothing about them violating your rights. Matter of fact, if you do the research, you see that judges have... Ooh, we we going to hold on y'all. I got to put y'all on. I'm sorry. This is what I wanted to say. Judges have absolute. That was embarrassing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about absolute positively, totally, totally, absolutely immunity. Absolute immunity. You know what the courts have said? Wait, hold on. We're going to put. Hold on. You know, we're not going to put judicial branch. We're not going to be that specific. We're going to say the judge has absolute immunity. That's what we're going to say. Because I did absolute immunity, and that wasn't good enough. So now we're going to specifically say the judge has absolute, absolute immunity. Here, Natalie's filing in this closed case fails to provide a basis for relief under Rule 60. To the extent that Natali seeks civil redress, civil redress, no, I'm seeking criminal redress, you ignorant mother, okay, against the judge who presided over the state court proceedings, the judge has absolute immunity from actions taken while carrying out traditional adjudicary functions. Goldstein versus Calvin. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh-oh, pay attention. If the state court matter has concluded, this court is without subject matter jurisdiction under Rooker-Feldman doctrine. The only federal court with authority to review rulings of state court under Rooker-Feldman doctrine is the United States Supreme Court under Rooker-Feldman doctrine. They're correct, 100% totally doodly because it's an administrative process. Whew. For which the judge has absolute immunity from suit. And the court will direct the clerk of the court to routinely, to route directly to the chambers any further pleadings Davis files in this court. If the pleadings appear to raise claims that can be heard in this court, it will be returned to the clerk's office with instructions to open a new case file. If the pleading suffers, for the same problem as here, it will be deemed dismissed without order and given no further consideration. They're going to dismiss it without even issuing an order? What the? How do they do that? So, ladies and gentlemen, how do you get around this? I was sitting here today getting ready to start putting together my documents because the judicial complaint document 
See, we're not making a complaint of misconduct. No, no, no. We're making a complaint for criminal redress, for violations of criminal law and criminal statute. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if we can pull up whether or not the judge has absolute immunity from criminal acts. Now remember, uh-oh, woo-wee, did you see that? I can't even use that like that. Whew. Oh, man. It said zero cases. And you know why you're going to have zero cases? I'll explain in a minute. Because I hadn't been thinking along this line before, but lately, this is all I've been thinking about. Resolving the issue of whether a state court judge has absolute immunity from a suit of damages under 42, 1983 from his decision to dismiss a subordinate court employee. Uh, let's see. There may be somewhat less reasons to cloak judges with absolute immunity from suit than there would be to protect such other officials. Indeed, to the extent that a judge is less free than most executive branch offices to delegate decision-making authority to subordinates. Yeah, because they're not before him in a lawful capacity, in other words, lawsuit to where he can exercise authority as a judge. Absolute immunity, however, is strong medicine justified only when the danger of official being deflected from the effective performance of their duties is very great. The danger here is not great enough, nor do we think it significant that Illinois law only a judge can hire and fire probation officers. Okay. So we're not worried about, I'm not concerned about the probation officer. Reviewing, probation officer's um, administrative position. So that's why I'm not worried about that because automatically he doesn't have immunity from that. Okay. Reviewing five considerations advanced by the Supreme Court in support of absolute judicial immunity. A judge has absolute judicial immunity from damages liability for acts performed in his judicial capacity well as we said when they engage in commerce they're not in the judicial capacity no more have absolutely many from actions or damages arising from acts that are specifically required to do under court order or at the judge's discretion see they say it's a discretionary act Court clerk is entitled to absolute immunity when it takes uh, tasks or integral to part of the judicial process. So when you try to go after the clerk of the court, they say, uh uh, you ain't coming after us. And we say, oh, yes, we are. There is a way, ladies and gentlemen. But hold on, one more. In addition to the specific safeguards contained in the Constitution, federal and state judges enjoy an absolute common law immunity. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing. Go ahead and look at the common law and see if a judge gets immunity from violating the rights of any citizen. Because the common law they're talking about doesn't exist. Okay, you don't believe me, I'll show it to you in just the ruling that we're talking about right now. Come on now, go back. You don't want to go back, y'all. It did this yesterday, and when it didn't go back, he went back years later. Let's see. Okay. See? It went back too far. It went back to the beginning. See? It went back to where no case is found. So I'm going to go to the last one. And then I'm going to go here. Let's see if this is where I need. It won't let me do nothing, so we stuck. In advance of its views of the 
separate from the merits aspect of the Cohen test, Justice Brennan dissent fails to account for our ruling on appealability of denial of claims of double jeopardy and absolute immunity. If, as the dissent seems to suggest, any factual overlap between the collateral issue and the merits of the plaintiff's claim is, uh oh, it won't let me finish reading that one. Fatal to the claim of immediate appealability, none of these matters could be appealed, for all of them require an inquiry into whether the plaintiff or in the double jeopardy situation, the government's... Come on now. It won't let me finish, y'all. Look what it did. It said you ain't gonna finish that conversation, mother... Hmm. Nope, won't let me. Oh, well. Let's see. We'll go one more again. Alright, it took me all the way down to the bottom. Started from the bottom, now we made it to the top. Okay, denying absolute immunity for a primarily administrative function. See, that's what I was saying earlier. As administrator, if you can highlight the fact that that judge is operating as an, admini in an administrative function, then he does not have absolute immunity. Okay? And here's the thing, they took an oath of office. So when they violate someone's rights, when they violate someone's rights, they're violating the oath of office because they're violating the Constitution. Okay, let's continue. In several cases, for example. Oh, come on! Yes, something went wrong. Stop playing with me, Google! One second. Okay, yeah, Google listens to the videos through their AI system while we do them especially when we're on the internet like I do so and that's why some of the videos take longer to upload because the system is going through the words and piecing them together and making sure I don't say anything outlandish in several cases for example we have considered the immunity due to prosecutors who mishandled or inappropriately withheld property confiscated from criminal defendants okay let's see give me one second Let's see. The seizure was conducted pursuant to state law and authorized for appropriate appropriation of property that either facilitated a criminal act or was obtained with the proceeds of a criminal act. Sorry that the computer is giving me that beeping. It's been doing that the last couple of days. I'm sorry. What I'm trying to show you guys is one thing. So we'll be getting there in just a second. So y'all just bear cat, dog, horse, wolf, mule with me okay yogi ah boo boo i was about to pick in the basket mr ranger sir uh ladies and gentlemen holding an absolutely meaning from suit for civil damages under 1983 does not necessarily immunize legislator or his aid from federal criminal prosecution however legislators immunize from suits of damages under 1983 ladies and gentlemen actually they are not if they have violated the law, then it's not 1983, it's 1985. Okay, hold on. Don't want the legislature. I know we put judge. Finding that prosecutor entitled absolute immunity for procuring a search warrant, requiring a factual inquiry that was unnecessary to the court's immunity analysis regarding the prosecutor's procurement of the arrest warrant. Okay, whatever. Um, hold on. Like I said, we're getting to one point, one point only. I'm just checking to see if we can find something real quick here, because I'm going to show you where. We've been going to the wrong place. Absolute judicial immunity does not shield a judge from criminal liability. Thank you! Got you! I'm sorry. That's what I was looking for. However, those judges were criminally convicted. See, generally, as of March, and this is the case. 
So ladies and gentlemen, this is the case. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, this is one case of judges being held criminally liable for violating somebody's rights. This judge took bribes from a private juvenile detention facility in exchange for sentencing children to those facilities. Uh-huh. That, that judge took bribes, y'all. Absolute just was denied the judge. Same case. Don't want it. Same information. Liable for damages arising out of his or her judicial actions in a criminal prosecution. A judge has absolute immunity from liability if there's a criminal prosecution. Uh-uh. We conclude that claims against judge blah, blah, blah were barred by judicial immunity. Who concluded this? This was back in 1986. Ladies and gentlemen, when a judge violates somebody's constitutionally secured rights, there is no absolute immunity. Because that's not due process. See, due process says that this judge, as long as he's doing a judicial act, can do whatever he wants. That's not how the law works. Okay? From civil liability, yeah, from civil liability, but not from criminal liability. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, here's the other thing you need to understand. A judge, when seated up on the bench, if he's carrying out his official duties, that means he's operating under, pay attention, he's operating under the Constitution. He's not operating under a different oath of office. Because if he's operating under a different oath of office, he's not performing a judicial act under the Constitution of the United States, which means he's not shielded. In 1895, the Supreme Court was confronted in Spalding versus Villas with the question as whether a similar privilege should be accorded to cabinet officer in respect to judicial immunity. We don't care about that. Uh taken in criminal proceeding except when the judge acts in clear absence of all jurisdiction except when a judge acts in clear absence of all jurisdiction now you notice how they say all jurisdiction no he must have jurisdiction over the person okay articulating broad immunity rule that a judge will not be deprived of immunity a judge has absolute immunity from suit. Nobody cares about that. Immunity can be overcome in only two types of circumstances. First, a judge may be liable for actions not taken in his judge's judicial... Now, here's the thing. This is the important thing. Judge's judicial capacity. You see, we keep thinking that judicial officers are judges. They are not. Okay, that's this case right here. We're going to go here because we need to see what's going on. Brother, brother, there's too many of you dying. And mother, 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 there's far too many of you crying. You know, we gotta find a way, and I know I found the way, so y'all just bear with me for a moment because that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna do the staple singers, I'ma take you there. Okay, so y'all just hold on with me. Okay, now what's number two? Oh, there it is, second. A judge may be liable for actions that are judicial in nature, but that are taken in complete absence of all jurisdiction. Now, the first one says, actions not taken in a judge's judicial capacity. Then the other one is absence of all jurisdiction. Ain't that interesting? Humphrey has failed to allege facts from which an extrajudicial act by any of the judicial defendants could be inferred. See, guess what? This extrajudicial act, hold on. We're going to do a little quick search on extrajudicial act. Now, what I want to show you is that's because judges are coming to this conclusion. Judges are coming to this conclusion. 
So what we need is an impartial body to come to a conclusion as to whether a judge has violated somebody's rights. We don't want misconduct. Misconduct is a slap on the hand. We don't want misconduct. We want criminal charges. We want them in a different venue. We want a jury trial. We don't want a judge trial. Each one of these cases where individuals are bringing claims against judges, notice what happens. It is a judge who dismisses it before it could even get to a jury. Obtained through extrajudicial acts can be as prejudicial as the extrajudicial acts themselves. We will not disturb this finding on appeal. However, we note that extra, extra record statements made by the juror concerning the defendant during the course of the jury trial are not presumptively so prejudicial as to infect the verdict and require the defendant be given a new trial. Concluding that the act stopped short of preempting extrajudicial repossession. No, I'm not looking for extrajudicial repossession. I'm looking for extrajudicial act. Since seeking conveyance of the Board of Trustees was an extrajudicial act, it was possible for an extrajudicial act to operate as an election of remedy. Um, nah. All right, let's take you there. Let's show you where we were going. Two things. First, this is the Tomo. This is the Jewish law. This document, hold on, let me show it to you. Law and morals in Jewish jurisprudence. Pull it up. This document explains where common law got its start. See, the Jewish people did the Talmud. I said it was the first five books of the Bible. I apologize. Talmud is the oral law. Okay? What we are interested in is the Torah. Not the Talmud. The Torah. The first five books of the Bible. Because that was the common law. That's why the law applied to alien resident as well as Jew. To slave as well as free person. It applied to everybody. So that's what y'all needs to know. And you do needs to know it. Okay? Legislation did exist to a limited extent in the form of a regulation. The most important among them perhaps being the prohibition against bigamy the rabbi legislative power was rarely invoked and even then really so they mean to tell me that those rabbis didn't all of a sudden convict somebody for blasphemy when they had no proof of blasphemy legislation often took a, the fictional form of an application all right ladies and gentlemen this is this is just a short page so I would suggest downloading it. It's just one page where it explains it. But, however, there's a whole document. That's just a preview. They want you to pay for it. I don't want to pay for it, y'all. Why? Because it's just information. Why would I pay for information like this? Uh-uh. Hold on. Let's see. Uh-oh. It won't let me. Let's see if it... It won't let me copy. Won't let me highlight and copy. He says, nope, you ain't doing that. I don't really care. I mean, I really don't care. I don't care. Let's take you to where you need to be. The issue is, the complaint against the judge with the Judiciary Committee of Congress. Can you file a complaint against the judge with Congress? Since Congress are the ones that have the authority to appoint judges. The Supreme Court cannot appoint a judge, even though they should have the authority to do that. Remember, they have absolute immunity, and it's a separate branch of the government. So why is it that all judges must be, pay attention, only Congress can remove an Article Three judge. Pay attention, only Congress can remove an Article Three judge. Pay attention, only Congress can remove an Article III judge. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have to figure out how to get Congress to give you the procedures. I don't have time to call Congress 
and ask them that. I don't have time to call the Senate Judiciary Committee. Okay, I don't have that time, but some of you do. And so I'm going to need your help to find out what are the procedures for removing an Article Three judge. And what I will do at that point, we know that Congress is restricted from transferring Article Three power to Article One judges. We know that Congress is restricted from transferring Article Three powers to Article One judges or even Article Four judges. Bankruptcy judges and magistrates are not Article Three. We know that Congress told the district courts that they could refer additional duties to magistrate judges as long as these duties did not interfere with the authority granted under the Constitution. When they try to force a magistrate on you in one of the district courts, they cannot. Doesn't matter if Congress says it's okay. They cannot because you have a right to be before a judge. He went on to say that the Florida courts are legislative courts and that the jurisdiction they exercise was conferred by Congress as part of the powers to govern territories of the United States. This decision suggests that only Congress may create tribunals capable of exercising non-Article III powers, not the court. In fact, the magistrates are examples of Article I courts created by Congress. Clearly, the magistrates are not to be confused with masters. The authors of the Harvard Law Review article cited above discuss this general problem. This is 1980, ladies and gentlemen. So, do me a favor. See if anybody else is talking about this. And then, wait about a month. And watch how everybody else is going to be talking about this. The next time you get a judge who wants to act outside their skin, who want to sit up there and talk out of the side of their neck. They don't get to say whatever they want to over that bench. That's a public record. They don't get to defame you. They don't get to create and fabricate evidence. They don't get to attack organizations such as mine just because they feel like it. But you have to do yourselves a favor, the same favor that I had to do. You have to not look at it in anger. Who has authority over a judge? Generally, Congress determines the jurisdiction of the federal court. Really? Congress determines the jurisdiction of the federal courts? Wasn't that supposed to be the people who did that? In some cases, however, such as in the example of disputes between two or more U.S. states, the Constitution grants the Supreme Court original jurisdiction, an authority that cannot be stripped by Congress. Yeah, because they came up with that 11th Amendment thing. Judicial Conduct and Disabilities Act. Ladies and gentlemen, Judicial Conduct and Disabilities Act was created by Congress to allow the judges to take care of themselves. The only problem is, you don't want a judge making a determination about another judge. This is what you want, committee jurisdiction. Let's find out what is the jurisdiction of the committee, the Judiciary Committee for the United States Senate, because that's where I was headed. That's why I was telling people we can use the Senate to take care of our business. In addition, jurisdiction to its crucial role in providing oversight for the Department of Justice and the agencies under the department's jurisdiction, including the Federal Bureau of Prisons, uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, sorry, Department of Homeland Security, the Judiciary Committee plans an important role, or plays, I'm sorry, in the consideration of nominations and pending legislation. Executive nominations, don't care. Judiciary committees are also charged with consideration of all Article Three judicial nominations. These include Supreme Court nominations, appellate court nominations, and district court nominations. The committee, the committee, the committee, the committee also considers nominations to the courts of international trade. In addition to its role in conducting oversight and consideration of nominations, the Senate Judiciary Committee also considers legislation resolution messages, petitions, uh, memorials, and other matters as provided for in the standing rules of the Senate. I want this standing rules of the Senate. We're going to click on that and let that open up on the next page. Appointment of representative bankruptcy, me, me espionage, counterfeiting, civil liabilities, constitutional amendments, federal court and judges, government information, holiday celebration, immigration, nationalizations, interstate, 
compacts generally, judicial proceedings, civil criminal generally, local courts in territories and possessions, measures relating to claims against the United States, national penitentiaries, patent office, patent copyright trademark, protection of trade and commerce against unlawful restraints and monopolies, revision and codifications of statutes of the United States state and territorial boundary lines. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you something? It's our fault. Uh-oh, it says a 404 message. It says, you ain't going here, homie. Uh-uh, you ain't going here. Four oh four. sorry. The page you requested is not found. The address may have been typed incorrectly. The page may have been moved or recently redesigned. Uh-uh, uh-uh, y'all don't get to do that. Oh, we go right here. Rules of the Senate. We just click up top. We ain't got to click on no stupid link. Uh-oh, administration. So this is administrative rules under the administrative branch of government, not the congressional branch of government. Protecting the freedom of, to vote. Recent changes in Georgia voting laws and the need for basic federal standards to make sure all Americans can vote in the way that works best for them. Why not what's best for the nation? Why you want to make sure Americans can vote so it's what's best for that American? Uh-uh, ain't it supposed to be the nation? One nation under all indivisible with liberty and justice from all? Ma, don't you get justice too? Sorry. Uh, give me a second. The Committee on the Library. Joint Committee on the Library. Joint Committee on Printing. Nope. This ain't no rules of the Senate. Nobody cares. Is this her? No, this ain't her. I thought this was that other woman. And Diane Feinstein, I'm disappointed in you. They made you out to be like you were some saint. But you ain't no saint, Diane. No, nah, just kidding. Uh, I don't know anything about Diane Feinstein other than that she's been a senator for years. I remember when she first got elected. At least they say she was elected. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see the standing rules of the Senate. It says rules of the Senate, but... Hold on. Okay, I clicked on rules. And it let me click on rules. But do you see anything that says you can click on rules? And it brought me right back here to the same thing. Same thing. Look at that. It, it ain't no rules. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need the standing rules of the Senate. So, y'all give me a second. Okay, the reason why I had you guys hold on were for two reasons. First, we needed to pull up the Senate document. Now, I haven't saved it yet, but I'm about to save it. And remember, this is a United States Government Information Office. GPO. The Printing Office for the United States Government. These are the rules for the committee. This thing is 1,487 pages long. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Control F. Let's do J U D I. Okay, C I A R Y. We're going to do judiciary. Uh oh, my computer didn't type in the rest. It said, hold on now, but you moving too fast for us. Uh, where my Y at? Okay, there go the Y, y'all. Says two times. Says it's only there two times, y'all. Oh, now six. Committee on the Judiciary, Civil Liabilities, Government Information, Holiday Celebration, Immigration, Naturalization, Interstate Compacts, Judicial Proceedings, Civil and Criminal. Okay, now remember, if they are judicial officers, their rules that they have to follow. Now the committee on the judiciary, okay, to which committee shall be referred all proposed legislation, messages, petitions, petitions, all petitions, not some of them, memorials and other matters related to the following subject. 
Now remember, when you write them, they're going to send you to the Judicial Misconduct Board. You're still going to file a complaint with judicial misconduct, but that's a civil action. If the judges are violating your secured rights as a citizen of any state of the United States, then what they have done is they've infringed upon them rights. There's 47 times judicial or judiciary is in here. 47 times, y'all. 47. Not just, don't want just number 18. We can always get back there. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Look, ladies and gentlemen, each branch of government has an oversight. One branch of government will have authority over another branch of government so long as they are violating your rights. Okay? As long as they're violating your rights. Now, hold on. We did judiciary. Like I said, there now, it was 47, now it's 50. Okay, but we're going to do judge. Forget judiciary. Come on now. It said I'm doing too much, so y'all hold on a sec. Okay, I typed in judge. And it says, judges of the court of claims don't care about that judge. There's six times. The first one was Supreme Court judges. And we got judges of the court of federal courts and judges. Okay, the committee and the judiciary. Thank you. We already had that. Come on now. Give me some. Oh, 14. Now 16. Serve as judges and justice appointed to hold office during good behavior. Okay, consideration for nomination to a position of level one of the executive schedule under section blah 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 title five. This is the administrative wait, hold on. Nominations covered. A nomination described in this paragraph is any nomination except for a nomination of an individual to a position of a level one or to serve as a judge okay so level one executive schedule under that is the administrative code let's see special rules for district court nominees if culture is invoked in accordance with rule 22 of the standing rules of Senate on a nomination of an individual to serve as a judge in the District Court of the United States, there shall be no more than two hours of post culture consideration equally divided in usual form. Sunset, this action shall expire on the day after the date of the Sunday adjournment of the 113th Congress. Well, that's not no more. 113 Congress, that was 100,000 years ago. 113 Congress. No, actually, it was only a couple of years ago, people. Come on. Or was it even this year? See, I'm only concerned about the 73rd Congress. Forget about that 185 billion Congress. Oh, what am I doing? I uh, The word judge appears in here 93 times. We already did that. Let's go to doing good behavior. Okay, got that. Good behavior. Good behavior means they ain't committed no crimes. They ain't violating no law. They ain't violating nobody's rights. That's good behavior. See, because the courts are often telling people when they own bad behavior. Now look same demand on district judge for certificate hmm change of place of meeting whenever Congress is about to convene and from the prevalence of contagious sickness or contagious somebody said somebody sick or the existence of any other circumstances it would, in the opinion of the president, be hazardous to the lives and health of the members to meet at a seat of government the president authorized by proclamation to convene Congress at such other place as he may judge proper. Pay attention, y'all. Remember that proclamation? You think that I'm going to be talking about 2039? No, 2038. 
That's where the president, by proclamation, said, Congress, you fools, get us over here right now. You're going to meet on the 8th and the 9th and the 10th, and you ain't got nothing you're going to say about. I don't care if you're on vacation. Get you over here now. The president gets to do that. Okay, let's continue. Jury duty exemption of elected officials of the legislative branch. Uh, they don't get to participate in jury duty. Uh, uh oh, got to be careful. I'm all the way to number nine, and I wasn't trying to get to number nine because it's slow. It ain't moving like it's supposed to. Google be messing with me, y'all. What we gonna do about that? Let's take care of the judges first. Then we gonna take care of Google. One second. Okay, remember I told you guys we updated the laws that you did not know exist? Well, there are several copies online right now. This one did not finish uploading, so we're going to process it so that it can finish uploading to where it needs to be. That's the first thing. Get that out of the way. So the laws that you did not know exist is all over the PDF section. But we're going to take the document that we're downloading now from the Senate, and we're going to put it all over as well we just has to save it yet oh not here get out of here get out of here not there uh we just has to save it ladies and gentlemen we told you guys about the trust funds well there's a judiciary trust fund did you know about that there's a disability fund then there is widows and heirs, deceased members of Congress. Nobody cares about that. Postal Service Fund. Then Resolution Trust Corporation Revolving Fund. Resolution Trust Corporation. Anybody know anything about this Resolution Trust Corporation? Oh, and we're not even going to talk about the Thrift Saving Fund. And all of these funds that Congress has created. All of these funds that Congress has created. Salaries for Article Three judges. Ain't it interesting? We can go on. Judges retirement fund. Judicial officers retirement fund. I look. This is the Court of Claims. Judicial Survivor Annuities Fund. Foreign Service Retirement Fund, Disability Fund, Civil Service, Comptroller General Retirement Fund. Now, the reason why the Comptroller, because the Comptroller and I believe like the Treasury Secretary, they are not supposed to be, from what I understand, it is believed, taking pensions. I mean, taking salaries, sorry. Okay. Tax Court Judges Survivors Annuity Fund. You'll see that bankruptcy court judges are not judges so let's continue because we need to get to the nitty-gritty any action brought under paragraph one two or three shall be heard and determined by a three judge court in accordance with 2284 of title 28 nothing in this section or in any other law shall infringe upon the right of the house representative to intervene in an action brought under paragraph one two and three without the necessity of adopting a resolution to authorize such intervention. Appeal to the Supreme Court. I appeal to the Supreme Court. No, we want to see expedited review, judicial review, expedited review. Any member of Congress may bring an action in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia for declaratory judgment or injunctive relief on the grounds that any other order that might be issued pursuant to 904 of this title violates the Constitution. Any member of Congress or any other person adversely affected by any action taken under this title may bring an action in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia for declaratory judgment and injunctive relief concerning the constitutionality of this title. Any member of Congress may bring an action in the United States District Okay, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking for information about you bringing a complaint to Congress, and we see that Congress does have the oversight. 
a master list composed of retired judges. Nobody cares about that. We are looking for Congress having the oversight over these officers. Individuals serving on panel and other bodies recommended federal judgeship service academies. Attorney, nope. There shall forthwith cause the others of the certificates and list to be delivered to the judge of the district or the electors. Nope, don't worry about that. The man on district judge for certificate. When no certificate of votes, okay, nah, not looking for that. I saw that earlier and I thought it might have been something else other than what it actually is and so that won't do. This section does not apply to justices or judges except to the extent provided in 456 of Title 28. Let's go ahead and take a look at this section and see what the title of this section is. Per denim, employee traveling on official business. Okay, so we're not concerned about the employees and them traveling and them thinking that it's official business. That doesn't help us. Foreign gifts and declarations. And we're going to probably do about three more. Wait a minute. Hold up. Wait a minute. Let's take a look at something. The Administrative Office of the United States Courts for Judges and Judicial Branch Employees. Pay attention. I want you guys to understand something. The Administrative Office of the United States Court for Judges and Judicial Branch Employees. The Administrative Office of the United States Courts is an administrative agency. It is not of the Judicial Branch. I can definitely prove that. Because they actually say it themselves, that they are not part of the judicial branch. Go to their website. Take a look. Now, I'm hoping it's still there because that's what the director actually even wrote me and said. While I was in Puerto Rico on vacation. Okay. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. What we're going to do is we're going to save this Judicial Officers Judicial Conference of the United States shall issue such interpretive guidance with relevant ethic rules applicable to federal judges, including the Code of Conduct for the United States judges, as necessary to clarify that no judicial officer may use non-public information derived from such person's position as a judicial officer or gain from the performance of other persons official responsibility as a means to make a private profit okay other federal officials blah 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 we're gonna save this save me save me save me one second everybody somebody go save that fool there we go all right since this is not going to give us what I need as far as the title, I'm going to copy and paste. All right. That's wrong. We're going to leave that there for now. Sorry, I'm having one of my moments. Okay, Senate standing rules, orders, laws, and regulations. We're going to save me. Okay, now by saving it, come on, come on, minimize. They don't want to minimize, y'all. It's about time. We're in the folder, as we were saying before, but what I have to do is I have to open this up. And then I'm going to have to cut this video show so we can put it up so that you guys can have it we know that there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to hold judges accountable 
Well, again, you've been going to judges, asking judges to hold judges accountable. Under their rule, judges are absolutely immune under their rules for the court, but not under the rules of law. Go ahead. Look at the case law. It's under the rules of the court that they say they're immune, but they don't get to determine their own immunity. There we go. There it is right there. We're going to put it here first. Come on now. All right. Now, it's going to go in this folder. And... Wait a minute. It said connection aborted. Uh-uh. You better re reboard that. Don't abort it. Reboard it. So it's going in downloads. That's the first one it's going to go in. Then we're going to put it in court case example. And that's where it's going to go next. Court case examples. Okay. And then I'm going to put it in FOIA. That's FOIA audio. I'm going to put it in FOIA audio. Then I'm going to put it in law. Then, one more again, I'm going to put it in lawsuit and stuff. And stuff. HR puffing stuff. Who's your friend when things get rough? HR puffing stuff. Sorry. I, I, I don't know why I went back all the way that far. Release dismissal complaints. By the way, we're going to do the Senate thing with uh, Mr. Bradley Christopher Stark as well. We're going to file a complaint with them. Since we can't seem to get nobody to pay him attention, we're going to get them to pay him attention. Okay? Because everybody, they got to see their administrative agencies. They got to follow their own rules. They got to. Got to, got to get you into my life. Okay. Trust documents. And that's going to be the final one that we're going to put it in. So you guys will be able to find this Senate document. You'll be able to look it up. You'll be able to look up what their rules are. You'll be able to look at how these officials are handled. Okay. How they are dealt with. By the way, judicial employee. The clerk of the court is a judicial employee. Clerk of the court is chosen by the Supreme are the presiding judge of the court and so they're judicial employees their sub clerks are also chosen by the same manner because they give the authority to the clerk of the court so there you go uh let's see i think one more will do one more section Judicial officer means the Chief Justice of the United States Court, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and Judge of the United States Court of Appeals. United States District Court for the District of Guam, blah, 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 blah. Tax Court claims, veterans, United States Court of Appeals, Armed Forces. Wait, hold on, wait, hold on. Judicial, pay attention, y'all, because I, I could be wrong. Judicial officer means the Chief Justice of the United States and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Judicial officer. Those are judicial officers. Hold on now. I want y'all to pay attention. And the judges of the Court of Appeals. The United States District Courts, including the District of Guam, the Northern Marina Islands, and the Virgin Islands. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the Court of International Trade, Tax Court, Court of Claims, Federal Claims, Court of Appeals for the Veteran Claims Office, the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, and any court created by act of Congress, the judges of which are entitled to hold office during good behavior. Okay, let's make sure of one thing. Nobody seems to pay attention to the Constitution. Constitution doesn't allow this. Once Congress conferred 
judicial power to the judicial branch, it doesn't then get to come and create the judicial branch by setting up all these other courts. The Constitution, if you understand the separation of powers, means that those powers create the branches. For instance, who created the Attorney General's office? No, it was not Congress. Well, Congress did in the Article 3 Act, so it's called the Judiciary Act, September 24th, 1789. The Attorney General is the attorney for the president, not the attorney for the people. He was never the attorney for the people. Okay? The Attorney General's office oversees all of the so-called executive branch law enforcement offices. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the point that we're bringing out here with them calling what a justice is. So, it says, and I need you guys to understand this. Judicial officer. It only defines what a judicial officer was because these are all administrative officers. These are not judges. Talks about created by act of Congress. I just wish I could explain this to people to where they get it. Congress had no authority to create a judicial officer. The only thing they had authority to do was to establish the judicial branch. Once they created separation of powers, prohibited them from interfering with that branch. They were supposed to create their own. But because Congress creates it, invents it, they have oversight over it. Which is why you get to file a complaint with Congress against the judge. Sorry. And that's going to be our next question. Because that was the question. So watch this. We're going to go baggity back. Don't talk smack. Green giant. What? I know it's yakety yak. Don't talk back. But, I, hey, I'm going to say it the way I say it. Yakety yak. Don't talk smack. Green giant. Uh, Give me one second. Rules to govern the handling of complaints against judges. Did I download this? Already? Wait a minute, Google, what you doing? I'm sorry. Google keeps messing with me, y'all. We're going to take care of Google real soon. Give me one second. Ladies and gentlemen, I just clicked on this article. An unfinished dialogue. Somebody needs to finish it. Congress, the judiciary, and the rules of the federal judicial misconduct proceedings. The author's name is D. Hellman. See? The author, his name is D. Hellman. <laughs> Sorry. By Arthur D. Hellman. It's an abstract. An abstract of judgment. I guess somebody's making a judgment. Federal judges can be impeached and removed from office for high crimes and misdemeanors. Misdemeanors? Misdemeanors? Yeah, the meaners are mean. <laughs> but what can be done to investigate and remedy less serious conduct? Well, what's a high crime and misdemeanor? Anybody know? Well, violation of rights while acting under color of law is a high crime. Why? Because it's a criminal act for a federal official to deprive a citizen of a state of a single right. Why? Because they are public servants and they cannot harm the public. Congress gave the answer 40 years ago when it passed the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980. The act emerged from a series of complex interactions between Congress and the judiciary that could hardly be replicated today. You mean to tell me Congress and the judiciary had a problem? Initially, there was strong support, particularly in the Senate, for a centralized, strictly adjudicatory system, including a provision for removal of judges without impeachment. Over the course of several years, however, the judiciary persuaded Congress to build instead 
a decentralized administrative approach. Told you, it's administrative. That the federal judiciary, judicial circuits were already using. The key actors in the system would be the circuit chief judges and the circuit councils. When the 1980 Act was passed, congressional leaders emphasized the need for continuing dialogue between the legislative and judicial branches and vigorous oversight by Congress. Ensuring decades, or issuing decades, have brought both dialogue and oversight of particular importance. In 2006, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee scalded the judiciary for what he viewed as a lax enforcement of the act. Judiciary responded in 2008 by promulgating its first set of nationally binding rules for misconduct proceedings. Modest revisions were made to the rules in 2015 and again in 2019. In both instances, expressed concerns from Congress played a role. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Congress is whom we need to complain to. I'm saying that if we get enough of you to start complaining and start letting your mamas know, your grandmamas know, your grandfathers know, we can take care of this. So this document right here, this one right here, we're going to... Hmm, no, I don't want to use that. I gotta, I'm going to pick a title. For this document. Mm, but yeah, it will be helpful that people understood what's going on so that when they uh, write their complaint, because police misconduct within their own ranks, people have been bringing complaints and complaints and complaints, and the judges have been ignoring their right to petition for redress. So this is where we're headed to Congress. Oh, I'm going to Congress. Oh, Mr. Bill goes to Congress. So if Mr. Bill can go to Congress, I want to go to Congress. Hey, Mr. Bill. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now, I'm sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last part of this video because we have just been on this mission for just a moment. Okay? Federal judges can be impeached and removed from office. It's the title of this document. We're going to do the same as we did with the others. We're going to put this in. No. No. I want. Don't know why. I need to go here. Okay. And then I need to go here. And then I need to go here. Wait a minute. Freshen up. Refresh. Freshen up. Uh, we got to go back. And then we got to go forward. Because I don't feel like clicking on a link for refresh. I just need to be able to fresh it up. Okay, we're going to put it in dismissal and release. So we're going to put it in the dismissal release folder. Because that's where it should go. Because that's the dismissal release folder is the folder we created specifically for our incarcerated individuals let's make sure I'm gonna put both of them there dismissal release okay and it will let me know if I've already put it there see there you go always use this action overwrite if newer it's not gonna overwrite because it's not gonna be newer it's gonna be new but not newer all right all right, ladies and gentlemen, so both documents are there. By the time this video is up, I will take a look at them. You guys got some research to do. There are some people who say they want to do research. Well, this is what I need your research on. I need you to understand these rules. I need you to find out what congressional rules are for impeaching a judge. I need to know how to file a complaint for impeachment of judge. I need you to understand this. We don't need the judge to be impeached. We just need the complaint to be filed. Okay, we don't want, we're not talking about no misconduct. We're talking about criminal acts. So you got to bring in, you got to, when you do your complaint, you got to bring in section 241, 242, 247 of Title 18. Title 18 is positive law, which means it's a law they have to follow. Watch this. 
Won't y'all to pay it? Did we put this in there? No, because I can't find this document. So that's why this isn't in there. So if I find this document, I'll put it in there. Okay. T I T L E 1 8 is, uh oh, got to get it right. Okay. P O S I T I V E L A W. Question mark. Let's see. Okay, positive law codification. Non-positive law, the code, is an editorial compilation of federal statutes. Who cares? Okay, I'm looking for Title 18 being positive law. Oh, by the way, you see this act right here? This is the Judiciary Act. This act is a joke. Okay? But... Let's go ahead and go here. Oh, that's not what I want. That's what I want. That's not what I want. That's what I want. Taxfreedom.com. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, they just created that thing called positive law. Okay. But we're going to go to govinfo.gov. Y'all remember Gov? Man, me and Gov go way back. As a matter of fact, we're going to go back right now. Because I have to. Why you got to? Because the other one, the link just below this, was PDF. And I want the PDF. So, see right here? So, let's get the PDF this way by opening that up. And then we'll go forward and get that that way. It's two birds, one stone type of thing. You feel me? All right, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, you have to bring Title 18. You have to bring Title 18. The reason why you have to bring Title 18, Section 241, 242, and 247, just go over them. You may not have to add 247 in your situation, 247, man, I remember 247. It's like I, there was a crew called the 247 crew, you know, and so I remember 247. No. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, 247 posse. Yeah, I knew the 247 posse. Young man named Taman was the one who started that. And Miss Master Wolf. 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 I'm sorry. Apologize. Uh,. Let's get this going so that you guys can have it. We'll also put this up there. The reason why we're putting in the Title 18 positive law information is for your benefit. Okay? This document is how many pages? Come on, give me the number of pages. 846 pages. Okay? This is Title 18. So 246247. Oh, I'm sorry. Some of you may not understand why you're using this code. You're going to use the June 5th, 1948 Act. Now remember, Title 18 was not created in 1948. Okay, this is when they supposedly... Now remember, this is the actual Act. It doesn't say the same as the Code. This is not the Code. This is the Act. 62 Stat, page 683. This is the statute at large this is what you want when you're quoting their junk because this has greater weight so when you're filing your complaint title 18 242 241 247 those are the main ones of the civil rights act of 1865 66 67 okie me dokie all right ladies and gentlemen It'll be up in a second. I'm going to... I got no choice. I have to put it up while I'm talking to you. Because if I don't... I'll put it in the same folder, release dismissal. If I don't put it up like this now, I'll forget. Oh, mama, he forgot again. I know, baby. But 
you know, he's got a lot on his mind. Well, he did that video where he says that he's going to be forgetting a whole lot of stuff. I wonder if it's just now happening to him. Well, earlier this morning, I did hear him say that he misplaced his glasses. And, you know, he has three pair. And so he's misplaced two pair already in one day. One day, misplaced them. And so now if he misplaces the ones he got on, he's a Bandini Creek. Bandini? Yes, Bandini is the word for fertilizer. Oh, he's a... Oh, mommy! Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for this video to end. I'm tired, and it's like time to go get some rest. So we got Title 18 and all the information you need to understand how to get some act right with some jizzimy edges. Okay? You need to know... You know what? As a matter of fact, we're going to put it one more place. We're going to put it in the statue. Okay? It's going to go there, too. Since we're talking about statutes at large, it's going to go in both places. Again, the object here is bringing forth a complaint against the judge. That complaint application, I will have, and I should have completed by, my hope is Wednesday, Thursday of this week. Can't promise because I got a lot to do. But my hope is to get that done. Okay? Now, I want all of you to understand something. If I'm not mistaken, this says criminal procedure. Do you see this section right here? We have a problem. We, we have a problem, ladies and gentlemen. And you guys may not be able to understand what that problem is, but I will show you in just a second. See, I am looking. Okay, no, we don't have a problem. Whew. Wait a minute, proof of claim? Wait a minute. Oh, bankruptcy procedure. I was about to say, Title 18, proof of claim? What the, you know, that's a man, I was, man, the Title 18, proof of claim would have been perfect for Title 18. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this right here, okay, when I saw 301, this is this is the problem. Let me let me see if I can point it out a little bit better. Uh, okay. Cuz I can't copy this the way I want because it won't let me. Come on now. All right, let me see if I can show you what I was talking about. V. And then we put Twenty-eight instead of eighteen, and ladies and gentlemen, most people don't understand this code right here, and but yet most people are familiar with it because they don't realize what's going on here. So I want to show it to you. And then we will definitely bring this video to a close. So I'm not that tired to where I'm willing to show you this information. This information will prove to be beneficial for some of you. Understand, Title 18, Section 3001. Except as provided in this section by, number one, chapter provides exclusive civil procedures for the United States to recover a judgment on a debt. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are in federal court, when you are in federal court, please understand, they are debt collectors. These are debt collection proceedings. Don't believe me? Except as provided in this section under that little number one is exclusive civil procedure for debt collections. Or obtain before judgment a claim for a debt and a remedy for connecting and remedy in connection with such claim. I didn't make this up. This is not this is not my doing. This is the known as the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act. 
The other act that you guys are familiar with is the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. This is the Fair Debt Collections Procedure Act. These are the procedures. Sorry, the wind is blowing and it's blowing one little piece of paper and a bunch of other pieces of paper all over the place. That's what the noise was. I apologize. Alright, let's click on this little link right here and see what it gives. It's not a link. Look at that. It's not a link. Let's see. Because I sure can't click on it. So let's see if it's a link. Well, it looks like it is a link. Interesting. But it's not a link. See? Can't click on it. It's a link, but it's not a link. It doesn't take you anywhere. Okay, subsection B. This is the limitation. Let's see what the limitation is. To the extent that another federal law provides procedures for recovering a claim or a judgment for a debt. You have a debt to pay to society, people, arising under such laws. The old procedures shall apply to such claim and judgment to the extent those procedures are inconsistent with this chapter. Okay? Amount owing other than debt. It's all debt collection. Wait, wait, wait. One last thing. One last thing. I said you guys didn't understand what was going on. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to change a number. We're going to... Move that, move that, and we're going to put 3,002. Uh-oh. That's not supposed to be. I didn't say 3,023. I said 3,002. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Anybody ever seen 28 U.S.C. 3,002? Because this is the same section. It says the Council of the United States means, and then you go all the way down here to 15. 14, 15, and it says KRS-1, United States means, under this title, a federal corporation, for what reason? For debt collection practices, and under the 14th Amendment, Section 4, pay attention, the 14th Amendment, Section 4, this is why you can't get out of court, this is why y'all keep Y'all keep running into problems. Watch this. I don't know what that title is, but we're going to do the 14th Amendment, Section 4. 14 A M E N D S E C T 4. And as soon as my computer catches up to me, because I seem to be moving too slow. One second. Now, say it again. Title 28. Section 3001 to 3033 is known as the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act. How do we know? Well, actually, for one, because it says that. Except as provided in B of this chapter, these are the exclusive procedures for the United States in collecting debts. Okay. Wait a minute. Hold on make sure y'all understand because y'all don't get it what does section 4 of the 14th amendment mean the validity of the public debt of the United States the validity of the public debt of the United States you're a member of the public the validity of the public debt of the United States you owe a debt to the United States the validity the validness the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law Congress including debts incurred for payments of pensions 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 and bounties for services and suppressing insurrection or rebellion shall not be questioned. Shall not be questioned. Are you questioning me, boy? So, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot question the United States means a federal corporation collection of debt. Pay attention. Shall not be questioned. They actually highlighted it. This is on constitution.congress.gov. They actually highlight it shall not be questioned. I didn't do that. I didn't even know what website it was. I didn't even look at that. 
until I just pointed it out to you guys because I saw it was highlighted. Highlighted. United States means a federal corporation, a federal debt collection corporation. That's why you can't get out of it. That's why you can't get out of it. That's why you can't get out of it because that debt, according to the United States, a law created by Congress known as the 14th Amendment, section number four, says it shall not, may not, cannot be questioned. So, the only way to get out of it is to bring about the jurisdiction of the court that that idiot sitting on a bench who knows all of this stuff or is supposed to know because they are not ignorant of the law that that idiot on a bench is not in a proper capacity that he is violating your rights which is the violation of his oath of office that he took for the office he was appointed by Congress that's simple alright ladies and gentlemen I did say that was it and I would have to go an hour and 20 minutes. I got to go. Y'all take care.